Hello comrades and welcome back to season 3 episode 8 of Spectre. I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by Dr. Connor McCabe. Connor, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on today. Ah, oh, cheers Nathan, sound. So just to start off, uh, Connor, if we could just get a kind of introduction from yourself, you know, your affiliations, uh, who you are and everything in between. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm an independent kind of researcher uh, who's based in Ireland, in the south. Um, I work mainly with kind of trade unions and kind of grassroots groups. Um, I work, I, I try to work with everyone on the left in Ireland, which is which is quite the achievement. But um, so um, but because of that, I'm not a member of any group. I I, I never have been. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it's an independent left kind of researcher, you know, and, um, I mainly kind of focus in on Irish kind of capitalism, how it works, its kind of uh, dynamics and, and not as an academic kind of exercise to feed that into kind of, into kind of groups and, you know, kind of assist in terms of analysis of the class and power dynamics on the island, north and south, you know, so that would be my very, my my background, you know, so it's mainly kind of back at shop research. Um, I'm not fun to shop. I'm not someone who shouts, you know, so I just like being in the back and kind of researching and then just like being there in, like, you know, there's a role for quiet people like me, even in kind of uh, socialism. So, yeah. No, cheers for that, Connor. That's perfect. And I, uh, especially when you talk about working with the left, sometimes it's easier to do that in the back rather than for the front. <laughs> um, most, most definitely, most definitely, yeah. So, yeah, I guess just to come on. Obviously, we'll we'll be talking uh, later on about your book, the Lost and Early Writings of James Connolly, uh, mm. eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety eight. But I guess just as a preface on, uh, you know, James Connolly himself was just looking to see if you can give a breakdown to, you know, who he was and why he's so remembered amongst both the Irish and Scottish socialists. He's certainly a figure that was kind of my my initial pull into the left, if you will, from mm. obviously being here in Scotland, uh, being a Celtic fan and uh, being around the terraces and kind of seeing that, that name being echoed amongst Irish Republicans and how distinguished they was amongst them and certainly his kind of understanding of the, the kind of as you talked about the the, the class analysis into mm-hmm. uh, the real liberation of Ireland in, in itself, so just to see if you can give us a breakdown of that. Yeah, um, his uh, like where he enters history, really, our kind of mainstream kind of history, is his involvement, his his crucial and key kind of involvement in the nineteen sixteen uh, rising uh, in Ireland, uh, the Easter Rising. Um, he was one of the leaders of it, and uh, he was uh, he was commander in chief of the armed forces, so uh, of both the IRB and the Irish kind of Citizen Army. Um, but his background is in is in kind of uh, it's in kind of Marxist republicanism. Um, I wouldn't say he's the founder of it, but he's the first one that I've come across really that really gave it a very firm, um, like theoretical anti-colonial, anti-imperialist kind of basis, and uh, that's his kind of innovation. You know. That's his main. Um, that's uh, that's one of his main kind of um, uh, like contributions in terms of um, of Irish and and British kind of uh, left kind of thinking. Um, he was born in in Edinburgh in eighteen uh, in eighteen sixty eight of of Irish parents and and was brought up in the in what would be seen as the as the kind of as the Irish kind of part of like Edinburgh at that time. So many so many kind of uh, by Cowgate, um, he enters into our world in in in, in terms of um, of writings in around kind of eighteen eighty nine, eighteen ninety. Um, he starts writing to newspapers in like in like eighteen ninety one, and he's his very first kind of published kind of writing. It's called What Is Wealth. So he's he's twenty three kind of years of age, and he's already giving um a very firm. Marx kind of analysis of of labor and wealth and 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 kind of capitalism. So when we meet him first, he's already a, a, a fairly kind of seasoned, um, uh, not just kind of socialist, but Marxist kind of activist, based in based in kind of Edinburgh. Um, as was his brother John. Uh, his brother John was it was six years older than him. Um, he served in the British Army, and in any of the 
in any of the groups that I've come across in like Edinburgh, um, they were they were kind of thick as thieves. So you have kind of John and Jim are constantly, you know, they're, they're always kind of together in terms of of kind of organising. Um, he was a member of the Scottish Socialist Confederation. They were affiliated f- for a while with the independent you know, kind of Labour Party that was set up by uh, Keir Hardy, among kind of others. And even though they they break that formal link, Connolly doesn't break his links with the Independent kind of Labour Party. And this is something that kind of runs through his entire life. He tries to be as as non-sectarian in, in, in a left sense as is possible. He will try and work with all kind of left groups. And it is one of his kind of, um, like it's one of his kind of continuities. Um, uh, he uh, he stands for election in in eighteen ninety four, and um, he took time off from his job as a carter uh, as a street cleaner, and um, he isn't he isn't really kind of taken back on. So he you know he he tries to make his you know his living as a full time like activist. It doesn't really kind of work out too well in like Edinburgh, and so um, he makes the move to Dublin. In May 1896, where where he is, uh, he's he's central in in setting up the Irish Socialist Republican Party, which is the first um, kind of a formal kind of Marxist a Republican um, structure, um, um, in Ireland. Um, where he's getting these ideas from is from Edinburgh. So I mean, this is something that I find kind of fascinating is that, in terms of Connolly's intellectual kind of background, um, it is that mix that's in Edinburgh. There's an Irish kind of community, but there's also a quite a vibrant radical kind of community, and and like and this and this helps kind of produce not only James Connolly but like John Connolly as uh, 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 as well. So we can almost say that Irish Marxists. Republicanism was more or less born in like Edinburgh, and then was imported into Ireland via, you know, via kind of a James Connolly. So, with Scotland's gift to Ireland is, is this mix? And I and I say that I'm, you know, not in a flippant way. I mean, I, I like the, like I think what the book kind of shows is that, um, in terms of Connolly's, in you know, kind of you know his his own kind of intellectual development, he was exceptional but he wasn't the exception he was coming from an atmosphere that really speaks to 1890s kind of edinburgh um by 1903 um uh, there are splits of factions in the party and connolly is he's 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 voted out of the party that he formed and he moves to um it, the us where you know he's an activist um first he's a political activist um, and then becomes a trade union kind of activist for the IWW. Uh, but by 1910, he's itching to get back to like Dublin, and he comes back, and he uh, it's not soon, and like soon afterwards, he becomes central to Jim Larkin's uh, union, the Irish Transport and the like, General Workers Union. There's a lockout in Dublin in in, in like 1913 that turns into full blown class war. Uh, comes at it's an international kind of story. And uh, by 1914, it, it, with the outbreak of, of, of like World War I, um, you can see kind of Connolly moving towards more of an insurrectory uh, view of things. And by 1916, he, he does take part in the 1916 rising. And by some accounts, he was he was probably, he was, he was one of the forces that was pushing for that. He, in 1916, there was a threat of of conscription that was hanging over Ireland, and uh, that seems to have been the impetus for the timing more it, it than anything else. Um, he's wounded during the fighting, and he is executed. He's the last of of, of the leaders. He was uh, he was executed, and um, he's he he's executed like sitting down. He's in a chair that uh, uh, because of his wounds. And then after that, he you know he enters into the into the martyrdom of Irish kind of nationalism. So that's where he he more or less kind of sits now. It's a it's this mixture of you know um, 
there's an argument that's made that Connolly lost his kind of socialism when he walked into the GPO, which was the headquarters of the of the Irish insurrection in 1916. But as I argue, and I'm not the first by any means, um, this is no, um, he was an anti country imperialist, so it made kind of perfect sense. So that's a that's a very superficial overview of a very complex man. So I hope that's okay. <laughs> No, that's perfect, Connor, and I just kind of encapsulates Connolly, mm. like his political journey. And it's just really astounding. It, it is as broad as kind of the work that he done as well. Mm. Uh, even yeah. his, his early early work in America is kind of you know it's fascinating when you you, you read that kind of period, uh, the early early nineteen hundreds, and then following after that, the kind of figureheads that, that men like Connolly became, and how how they're kind of rich. Pre rising history is almost entirely forgotten or that like, kind of brushed aside. It's just that one focal point that's, you know, uh, amplified. And, mm. you know, the next point I had was kind of on the early years of Connolly, but you've given such a great uh, kind of brief, it's almost rendered it uh, redundant. Yeah, but I guess, guess to touch on it would be kind of looking at Connolly and going through that political journey in himself from, from like you said, uh, in Edinburgh, uh, even his British Army service, uh, you know. Just want to get your view on how important it is not just to to recognise uh, that kind of journey, but to document it and the importance that has, I guess, on the the movement as a whole. Well, I mean, there's no evidence that he was in the the British Army. Um, like this is something that I go into in the book. Um, it's an it's an assumption that has been made, but this when we go digging, there's absolutely kind of no evidence for it kind of whatsoever. And and the main uh, person who was who was pushed this story was it was C. Desmond Greaves. And it, when I went kind of digging into where he kind of based the story on, it's mainly rumors and kind of conjecture. And then more kind of unforgivably, uh, he then invented details in terms of the story in order to to make it more kind of credible. Um, so. We can say that there's there's absolutely no evidence that he was in the British Army, apart from rumour and conjecture. Rumours that were started by, I mentioned that split in the ISRP in like 1903, uh, the right wing faction of that, um, they're still around in kind of 1912 and like 1913. And they produce a newspaper that is anti um Larkin, it's anti James Connolly and it's anti DITG AW, and they're the ones who, who's yeah, who started this rumor that Connolly he was a member of the Monaghan kind of militia, which you know, which, which was a double, which was a real slur on Connolly, not because of the British Army thing, but the Monaghan kind of militia were infamous in seventeen ninety eight, uh, as being, um as being, uh, you know, anti-United uh, Irishmen and and were instrumental in 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 dampening um, any form of local uprising in the North in like 1798. So they knew what they were doing, you know. Um, but there's no evidence that he was in the army. I mean, it, it doesn't change it. I mean, the, the, uh, the Connolly we have in our minds is in the British army and we think and it makes no difference as to how we kind of see him. But it's about being honest to the evidence and being honest to the man himself. Um, so there's no evidence. And it's not, and like, you can't prove a negative. So I can't say that he was never in, in the British Army because you can't prove something that is negative. Uh, but it's not up to me to prove that. It's up to those to say that he was to produce something that shows that he was. And in the 63 years since since Grieve, Grieve's published uh his book claiming that Connolly was in the British Army, not one shred of evidence has uh, has been produced to kind of verify that. And when we checked, we're now able to check kind of Greaves' um, story because uh, his journals are now up online. And we can see from his own kind of accounts how he changed and doctored kind of, uh, you know, even what people who were in their 70s. A, a woman was an alcoholic. Uh, he was in his 70s. And this is... An, and this was a Greaves' own kind of um, a description of him. And then another was about six months away from dying, you know, so he was in that kind of, uh, like that kind of frame of mind. So in terms of the army story, there's just 
there is no evidence. You know, his brother was in the army, um, and, and like Malcolm Mallon, uh, he was he was one of the leaders of the nineteen sixteen rise, and he served in India in the British army. So it makes no difference in terms of that. Just you know, it's a reflection of of the Irish kind of history itself. Like, but there's no evidence for it. Yeah, no, I think it's as you say there. It's that kind of. It's about being like honest that. to him. You know, what I, you know what I mean. Like yeah. you know, like like going back to your point there around how. Uh, like one of the impetus for this book has been to kind of get back to a more kind of rounded kind of view of like James Connolly and his environment and where he he came from and his own kind of intellectual um, like innovations and like brilliance, you know. And um, we have to undo a lot of the damage that has been done over 60, 70, 80, 100 years or so, you know, and this is one part of it. Yeah, no, bang on. I was just to say that, you know, but it's like you say, even if it was true that it was in the British Army, it doesn't paint him in any worse of a light, if anything. It makes it no have, difference whatsoever. Could have, yeah. could have done a, a positive on him, <laughs> if anything. Yeah. But it's that that importance of the documentation to have, because there, there's clear documentation, historical record from his time in America, uh, his work in union and party organising. So, yeah, 100%. It's about getting that clear, rounded view as possible and not letting... Mm history be rewritten uh, and figures like Conley or that be rewritten to, to suit anybody else's narrative. We want the, the kind of clearest image possible uh, mm. to to reference, to reference in the past so that we can draw towards, you know, what's needed for the future. So, you know, 100% agree in kind of Connolly's history and it being, you know, a true reflection uh, of our journey because I think there'll be a, a lot of, well, a lot of similarities for folk trying to, going in their own personal journeys as well and looking at heroes like Connolly and whatnot and, mm. and, and seeing their past. So, no, I 100% agree with that. Uh, and I just echo your importance and the uh, the need to to get that clear, rounded figure of Connolly away from any kind of rewriting uh, or any kind of historical revisionism around events or just uh, his livelihood in general. So, no, I think that's bang on. Uh, and I guess it kind of leads us to, you know, the Easter Rise and the actual execution of Connolly. Uh, mm. Like we say, we said earlier that the actual 1916 Easter Rising is what is most uh, personified and magnified in as opposed to any of his early work. And, you know, the mainstream treats him just purely as uh, an Irish Republican uh, in disregard to his class uh, or, or Marxist lens uh, on things. So it's just to see if he can give us a kind of brief on Connolly's part in the Easter Rising uh, and you know the events that led to his uh, execution and how that kind of played and role with his his figure today and and being a a just renowned martyr for the, uh, the Irish cause. Yeah, um, like what, like what we were able to, or or like what this book kind of uh, shows is that um, like again. There's a mainstream kind of narrative, and it's not just in terms of of like centrist or the right wing. It's also in aspects of of, of the left as well. Is that like like going back to the point that it's argued that James Connolly abandoned his like socialism by embracing Irish republicanism in like 1915, and somehow you know he fell in with a bad crowd. You know, this is kind of idea of that. And you can see it from his writings. It's there from 1895 onwards. You know, it's just there, like, because how I frame it is that where, where Connolly is able to merge his Marxism isn't just his, like, socialism, but his Marxism with the Irish kind of nationalist, um, you know, movement is that it is through his own kind of journey or the journey of him and his brother and that group that you are members of in, in, in Edinburgh towards what is now seen as a anti-imperialist, anti-colonial kind of Marxism, something that becomes quite, quite more, it, it rises to the fore after the First World War and really after the Second World War in what is called uh, so, so-called kind of global self. So you'll get it in terms of uh, Krabal and um, Amen and uh, Fanon and uh, and uh, and so forth, and you get these kind of writers who, who you know who 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 recognise that in a colonial kind of situation, uh, there's a scientific kind of necessity 
if you're a Marxist, to be um, to be kind of nationalist or, or, or to fight for kind of independence because the very nature of of kind of capitalism in your state, it's not just you know an off the shelf kind of capitalism. It's very much a, a, an extractive kind of colonial form of that. So you can't get rid of the like you can't change the kind of political kind of structures and not change the economic structures from an anti-imperialist kind of point of view because it's an anti-imperialist presence in your country. So you have to kind of take that on, on, on as well. And that's, Connie's making these arguments very, very clearly from 1896, 1897 onwards. Um, and it makes complete sense, his involvement in the 1916 Rising based on that. Um, it's lost, it was lost on on aspects of the Scottish and 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 English kind of uh, left, there was a there was um there was a Scottish kind of leader called Tom Johnson. He was involved in in I think justice or yeah in the newspaper kind of justice or and um, he actually writes I don't know why Connolly did this you know he he like he's very kind of sympathetic because you know he knew the man but basically says I don't know why Connolly took part in this kind of uprising. And then as others who went, we know exactly why he, he, he did this. It makes complete sense. And including Lenin, uh, you know, Lenin uh, very famously saw completely what Connolly it was about and saw it as an anti-imperialist kind of strike. So you have that kind of view of him. Um, what you get in Ireland um, from nine, from the 1920s onwards is that in the carnival of, of like reaction, which Connolly kind of uh, you know kind of warn against, in terms of like partition, there's also a quite conservative trade union movement uh, being formed down south. They have a problem with kind of James Connolly because they they dismiss Jim Larkin, who's who's more or less kind of written out of trade union history until the 1970s, uh, but they can't dismiss James Connolly because he's part of the of the 1916 rising, he's one of, he's one of the executed kind of 15 leaders. So they have to deal with him somehow. So they turn him into this kind of Christian socialist, you know, kind of trade unionist. And they and he start cutting his words. So what we find in is that um uh in 1948 there are there are three from 1948 until 1951 there are four volumes of the Connolly's writings that are brought out and they're brought and they're edited by a man called William O'Brien it will help with kind of Desmond Ryan. And they cut Ed Connolly's words. Um and they try to cut as much of the socialism and and kind of Marxism as he could possibly kind of get away with. Uh, so whereas his books and his pamphlets um are printed as he wrote them in terms of his articles and his uh, and his speeches uh, 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 of which there are around kind of seven hundred, they're changed um to try and kind of fit Connolly into a kind of corporatist, conservative, kind of trade unionist, and see him only as a trade unionist. And uh, it's it's quite successful. Um, those issues are compounded in the late 1990s when Connolly's writings are being transposed onto the internet via the Marxist Internet kind of Archive, because not in all cases, but in many of the articles that are up, and not all of them by any means, but a good proportion of them, um, they're taken from the William O'Brien versions and not the original ones. So you get reproduced for a whole new for a whole new generation. Um, a nineteen forties conservative view of like James Connolly is reborn in the nineteen nineties via the big the, the World Wide Web. So it's extremely frustrating. And like even today, there still isn't a complete volume. Or, or there isn't a, a complete kind of collection of his writings. Uh, his books and pamphlets are fine. They're anything I've seen of them. They are they are reproduced as the Connolly wrote them. Um, so if you have Labour and the Irish history, there's there's like that is as kind of Connolly wrote it. But in terms of his articles, um, these are these are kind of problematic. But that was not done through error. That was done through ideology. It was trying to fit Connolly somehow into a 1940s Catholic conservative Ireland, which was difficult, so they had to cut him. Um, it's why I kind of argue that somewhat kind of flippantly, but uh, 
but it will make the point that Ed Connolly has to be one of the most quoted but least read figures in in, in the Irish history, um, and we're trying to um, change that. Have a rambled on, kind of, you know, kind of too much there, uh, you know, Nathan. Sorry about that. No, no, that's good. Uh, uh, you're bang on, I mean, it kind of just touches on what we were talking about earlier with that kind of rewriting the history mm. uh, on, on Connolly's life in itself, and we see that with his actual writings uh, that he's done himself. So it's, it's like you said, it's this actual class attack to, to kind of liquidate figures like Connolly, to dilute them down, uh, to be you know, less harmful mm. in that kind of sense. And I guess it kind of comes on to what, we'll, what the next point is, is on the the legacy that Connolly's left behind. It's it's claimed by so many uh, across both, you know, the left and, and the right, if you will. Uh, and that's, we can see that being claimed in they kind of ways, either it's claimed by the left and the full republishing of his work with that clear class analysis at the forefront and personified or like you said it's completely eliminated diluted down uh, either as a, a, a kind of ideological attack uh, against one of Ireland's most famous martyrs uh, because it, it never is done uh, accidentally you can't just accidentally no. get rid of you know the clear understanding that Connolly had and kept with him uh, during that time so I think you're absolutely you know bang on there and I think just to come on to the last point and because I'll, I'll definitely love to to let you ramble about uh, your book now so you've got the, the full range so uh, the lost and early writings of James Connolly from 1889 to 1898 uh, just to see if you can give everybody you know a rundown of what that uh, encapsulates and uh, I guess we've talked already the importance of showcasing uh, Connolly's political kind of journey, his writings as well, especially uh, given that, you know, as you've highlighted, they've been under attack or uh, to try to be removed from history, diluted down or, or pushed to the back. So uh, now's your chance to to give us a show uh, of your actual book. Yeah, well, um, just before I, I, I can delve into it, um, I just realised there that I, that I left a kind of uh, one kind of a really kind of important point in in terms of the Connolly and just go back to your kind of question about kind of you know his legacy and and you know how he's used is it's the troubles. Um. So so whereas in the nineteen forties there was a move to have a certain view of like of, of kind of James Connolly. This this dynamic happens all over again. When the troubles kind of break out in the north in but nineteen sixty nine, um, so you have kind of Connolly who is now extremely kind of relevant again, uh, but you have kind of various factions who have now this problem with kind of James Connolly who seems to be speaking to a lot of the issues that are being raised in in terms of what is a violent a violent a violent, a violent, a violent kind of insurrection, um, all over again, you know, fifty years after it what happens in Dublin, but now it's Belfast. And um, so you have Connolly been used not in terms of his writings. There are like there are no kind of good fake kind of actors here. People are delving into his archives, but they're doing it to find kind of select words to then throw at each other. And I think that's a legacy which we have to, which now with the you know with you know like twenty five years or so after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. This is I'm not in in any way saying that the North has been solved or anything, but the violence has stopped and that somehow kind of takes the, that has taken some of the temperature out of the, uh, like out of the whole kind of debate. So we can actually now talk about, you know, Connolly, you know, with some of the temperature kind of, uh, you know, kind of taken down, but like it, it would be kind of really miss of me not to mention that Connolly again is then, you know, he's used, you know, people kind of ripping, pieces of flesh off and just to throw at each other and I'm mean, getting kind of quite vicious about it, you know. Um, but now, hopefully, we can now kind of delve into his writings. And that's part of the book is is, is kind of trying to get him to to speak on his own terms. Um, so it, it covers 1889 until 1898 and um, it reproduces around 60 articles, but um, it, like, I found eighteen new pieces of of writing 
in in the process of of um of kind of doing this book um eleven new articles uh four new kind of short stories and and like three letters that you wrote to kind of cure Hardy so even in terms of the uh, of the book itself like there's a like there's a whole wealth of new of kind of new writings that are there and um there's another nineteen articles that are either republished for the first time in over a hundred years or are, are can be published in full for the first time in over a like hundred years, including uh, that be published for the first time, the original version of, of one of Connolly's most famous works, which is nationalism and, and like socialism, which he wrote in like in, in, in like in like eighteen ninety seven. So I think that like it, it like what the book does is that we're starting to see him in the round, you know, as you said yourself that kind of earlier on. Uh like from the start, we can see that, you know, he's you know, he's he's a naturally kind of gifted writer. Um when he's 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 quite funny, he's quite caustic, he's 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 quite witty. Um and when you've been edited by dour humorless uh, bureaucratic trade unionists, you tend to get a James Connolly who looks a bit like a dark and bureaucratic humanist kind of trade unionist. And that has been an absolute uh, crime against him because he is quite funny. Uh, and he's, you know, very kind of sarcastic in a, in a quite kind of brilliant way, as was Marx, of course. You know, I mean, if you read any of like Marx's kind of journalism, you know, like, you know, it's the same thing as, 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 uh, as well. But we also get a sense of just how incredibly well read he is. Um, incredibly, this is the first kind of collection of his writings that is actually fully foot that is actually fully kind of footnoted. So, so we even have a a, a kind of situation where not only has the kind of writings they haven't been kind of a, a, you know published in the full of those kind of collections that are there, he hasn't been kind of footnoted or or or, or, or treated in any kind of scholarly way. And what you get, and what you get from the footnotes is is a sense of just how well, of just how well read he was. He throws in quotes from writers they like all the time. He's he is he is he is particularly fond of Shakespeare, and and the Bible, um, which is quite kind of befitting uh, what would be a kind of Marxist preacher on the streets of of Edinburgh in like in 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 in, in the eighteen nineties. And uh, he's, you know, he he quotes from Burns, from Dickens, from Walt Whitman, um, and he sometimes gets these quotes slightly wrong, which I really like because it shows that it's from memory. He's not just sitting there with a pile of books trying to show off. Um, like this is from his own kind of memory, and, and his own kind of reading. So, like, um, and and also you get this merging, this new kind of innovation. In terms of his own kind of thinking, uh, where where he does take um, a socialist kind of republicanism and brings it one step further, uh, further, and he's able to identify in Ireland that uh, there's a certain kind of Catholic kind of middle class that are quite nationalist but are also pro imperialist, and and you've got to watch them. Now we know from other studies in the last hundred years that. This is something that is common with most kind of colonial, but it, 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 like situations. You have this kind of compador middleman intermediary class um, who are separate from your so-called uh, national kind of bourgeoisie. Um, they they are kind of nationalist, but they have a thousand economic strings, a with you know with kind of imperialism and don't want to break them and colonies. You know, he's telling us in the 1890s, watch this class. If they take over, they'll only change the flag over kind of Dublin Castle. They won't do kind of anything else. Um, so whereas you had other socialists, you know, socialist uh, nationalists in Dublin writing about how we need to build kind of socialism in a, you know, under a, a kind of home rule kind of parliament, Connolly is saying that you're cutting yourself because you don't actually understand that the economic dynamics in Ireland are not just capitalist, they are they're 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 they are kind of colonial kind of capitalist. That's a different beast to Manchester or London or Birmingham 
or even you know so so the very extractive nature of a colonial a capitalist a setup and the and the classes that emerge out of that that's Conley's kind of innovation he really kind of identifies them now they had been kind of identified as early as the 1840s um but it's lost as as knowledge gets lost, it's lost. And Connolly kind of, you know, he, to his own kind of uh, readings and to his own kind of study groups and his own kind of activism, just as a street kind of agitator, is able to do what Marxists should do, which is to see kind of Marxism as a methodology and not as a theology. So he's using it as a methodology and he he's applying it to the actually existing mode of of the production in Ireland, seeing that it's a colonial mode, and then seeing that, that there are very particular the colonial class relations that are beyond the the so-called settler and colonial ones, which are seen in terms of 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 of, of unionism. He's writing from the 1890s saying, yes, we know about them, but it's the Catholic and the middle classes who are also kind of imperialist. They're the ones, you know, it, it, we have to watch because they're the ones who are leading it, the independence kind of movement and they will shape any kind of independent Ireland in their own image, which is precisely what happened. He was he was completely kind of spot on. Yeah, no, spot on, Conan. I mean, uh, that's a superb rundown. Uh, and I know you've been doing the, the kind of book launches across uh, across both Ireland and uh, even up here in Scotland. How how have they been going? Uh, and kind of what's been the the reception like of the book in itself? It's been it's, it, it, it's been pretty good. Um, we were quite lucky uh, or fortunate to get Kilmainham Jail for the launch in, in in Dublin. And there's a wonderful clip online of a. The, of an activist, um, he he stood he stood in election act, actually for the for people before profit, but own oh um oh the Canavan, and he sings this amazing kind of version of where oh where is that kind of James Connolly in command in jail and it's the just with the just with the kind of acoustics um it's up online and and, and it's quite stirring. We had two kind of great launches uh, in like Lighthouse Books in like Edinburgh and in. And and then one organised by Carlton Books in 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 the Glasgow, and they were and they were my they were my favourite even more than like the And I'm, I'm not just saying that because this is my spinal tap. Hello Cleveland, a moment. I, like isn't, I, I I'm not just going to say that, but it was because it it was bringing it was that sense of kind of bringing bringing kind of James Connolly home, and that really kind of appealed to me because. Um, I can see that, you know, his intellectual kind of development was Edinburgh, you know. Again, it with those kind of those kind of very particular kind of but dynamics a, a, a quite strong and vibrant Irish kind of immigrant uh you know kind of um you know kind of setting. But also kind of merging with the very strong and and vibrant, you know, like you know, kind of radical history. Of Edinburgh and Scotland itself, of you know, you know, very deep and and the radical kind of thinkers, and out of that kind of merger comes someone like kind of James Connolly. Um, so when I say that, like bringing them home, it's yeah, it's 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 it's, it's really true, you know. I mean, you know, he his light blazes, you know, across history when he's in Ireland, but he he is formed in 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 Scotland in like Edinburgh, you know. Now, like you know, like he he always considered himself um, an Irishman um, it, when he was campaigning there for election in in, in November eighteen ninety five. He's saying, as an Irishman, I am calling for your vote. Like you know, so like he was he was never like this is always kind of part of him. But again, that's part of like Edinburgh, and that's part of of its history. You know, is having that kind of Irish kind of identity in a like you know, like in a kind of Scotch kind of setting, you know. So like, like I, I genuinely don't. Th- I think kind of Connolly, he would have been a radical, no matter where he was born. But I don't think he would have had access to the same kind of Marxist 
ideas and kind of conversations if he was he was in Dublin or in, or, or in kind of or, or in kind of uh, Black Monaghan. So I think it is quite important that these mixtures, these did uh, these these did kind of help you know make kind of you know Deacon James Connolly, who we know, and more or less it's all there. So like like as I said. It, it, it look in the eighteen nineties, his core kind of analysis and his core and his core kind of ideas, they are there. And he didn't make them in in, in Dublin. He brought them to Dublin. So he had to teach those those Dublin kind of boyos. It, it just what kind of Marxist re, uh, republicanism, uh, you know, kind of you know, uh, like actually kind of looked like, you know. So like they've been they've been quite good. They've been quite kind of vibrant. But like um. And this is also down to kind of Ishka books, who have been just kind of amazing. They they produce. Have you got a copy of it yet? Have you seen it yet? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. guilty guilty of this and not getting your book before doing this podcast. But no, thankfully... it's up. It's up. It's up online anyway. So <laughs> like you know because um no, but, no like I say that it just only because um they've done it's a beautiful book and uh, as they usually do and it's a it's a wonderful uh, piece of work. But also it's available online as a free kind of PDF. And that was a real kind of selling point for me in in terms of like Ishku. One is, is that they produce really kind of you know kind of cutting edge anti imperialist kind of Marxist thinking at the moment anyway. Um, so like you know Connolly, like if he belongs anywhere, he belongs there. I think. S- secondly, they produce they're beautiful books, but thirdly, they also have this thing that. All the books are available as free to like download, and I really and that really appeals to me because I can't on one hand bemoan the versions of Connolly that are available free online and then put a paywall up <laughs> for you know for, for access for the for the so called kind of corrected you know versions. So um, so yeah, so the Gishka books, ha- I know, ha- ha- have been kind of amazing, you know, and. Uh, it's informal still, but we are talking about carrying on and doing another four volumes, which which takes us up to uh, up to nineteen sixteen. But but no contracts have been signed yet, so we have to see. Um, but I think I think they're happy as well. So we see what happens. It's certainly like it's it's been a good marriage kind of so far, anyway. Yeah, no, it's great to hear, Conan. Yeah, I'm guilty of this and no buying your book before doing this, but no, we just stop. I'm, I'm stop. I'm in Dublin this week, so I'll be able to bit pick up for you. quite fittingly Connolly books. So oh, Connolly I'll books, do your yeah, service yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> say hi, say hi to Aaron. If you know they're for me as well, so yeah. But it, it, the Connolly books in 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 Dublin, it, if people don't know it, you know it's an institution anyway. But they've been brilliant. They've been just so supportive, and Aaron and 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 Eugene as well. They've been absolutely brilliant. You know. Like in terms of like stocking it, it's the only that there's now there are two shops in 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 Dublin that are stocking it, and it's mainly Connolly books, and then it's um it's Alan Hannah's in in the Grat Mines, but they're the only ones who are who are stocking it. So yeah, they're quite brilliant. Uh, big fans of the Connolly books here. No, oh, good, good stuff, and uh, also I, I love that sentiment you made uh, about kind of bringing Connolly home. Uh, yeah, the likes of Scotland, so that that does sound lovely, and I'm gutted as well that I missed it on the on both the book launches in Edinburgh. Uh, sadly, being away to to Poland for that, but from from what I've seen and to those I've spoke to who have purchased your your book and have be, have began to read it, is that it does do that serve as a capturing, like you said, Connolly's intellectual development, the knowledge that he did have even at that time, uh, as well as. Like you say, his charisma, his, his personal kind of commitment to seeing uh, that emancipation for the working class, you know. So it's uh, again, it falls back to everything we've kind of talked about the, that importance of documenting this to see kind of characters like Connolly and their their humanity first and foremost, because obviously we we in the left kind of put these people on massive pillars and and quite rightly so, in my opinion. But to see them as you know the human beside you to that person on the uh, the shop floor, you know, that's that's the kind of real tone that you want as well to kind of capture. So it's been fantastic well, I mean, to hear. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, it's like on that point about kind of uh, like putting Conley like up on a pedestal, um, 
like before I like before we started on this volume of it, um I I transcribed all of his writings anyway, just to make sure because like I had this kind of a project in in mind of of of, 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 of kind of republishing all of his writings for the very first time. So, so it's been kind of 18 months and I transcribed everything that's known. It's around 800,000 words. So everything from 1889 up to 1916. So this is the first volume of that. It's, it's And it's only like 10% of that. Um, but, but the reason being was that I needed to know that this was doable. And also because we've been here before where people have to come on and said, now's the time to publish all of all of James Conlon's kind of writings. So I didn't want to be kind of that person who just like says this, that it, that, that this needs to be done, does one book and then that's it because it's just too kind of overwhelming. I have it all. It's all in kind of one file. It's all about kind of, you know, kind of uh, footnoting and it's all rough. But that's my long way of saying is that you cannot read 800,000 words by anyone and not realize that they've got feet of clay. And um and I think that is kind of important. Um that I think by a volume five we will have a walking around it view of like James Connolly, stuff that he got right and then stuff that he might have gotten wrong. And that's good because because then like he turns into what I think where with well, this is my background, but where I see him as like um how I see kind of James Connolly and like the reason why I'm doing this project is that the guy wrote books on kind of Irish on Irish kind of capitalism. Um but how I see history is how is from a Marxist way, which is that uh, you see history, it's a canvas that allows you to observe deep social and economic forces in motion. So I'm able to look at Connolly talking about this class in the 1890s, I can really kind of patter O'Donnell in, in the 1930s, also talking about this class. And then I can see them in my own work then as well. And then that helps me chart this kind of middleman, compadre, intermediary class through a Marxist kind of methodology. So for me, he's a, he's a brilliant resource because he's a Marxist in the 1900s, in, in, in the 1900s, phoning it in, telling us what he's saying. And then we can take that kind of information and help chart from a Marxist, uh, you know, kind of uh, perspective. What are the actually existing class kind of dynamics on the island of Ireland? Because you need that time frame. Same as kind of climate studies, uh, and you can't see how the how you know how like how kind of climate change is over kind of one year or the ten years. Like you need that kind of one year kind of framework. So it's kind of kind of gives us that. So then that, I think, helps kind of put him back on to where he belongs, I think, which is, you know, as a Marxist Republican, doing what Marxists should be doing, which is seeing Marxism as a methodology to understand the world in order to change it, in order to change that world, um, rather than as a theology where you find quotes just to fling at each other, you know? So, um, so, so hopefully... You know, he'd be brought back into that kind of uh, into that kind of methodology that you know, it, you know, like there as well. And he's a brilliant practitioner of Marxism, so I think we have a lot to like learn from him uh, from that kind of you know that way as well. Yeah, no, I've sort of spawned there, Connor. I don't think I could even add anything to that. That's a that's a great kind of analysis of it. So, I guess just to finish off, we we kind of any final talking points from yourself, uh, and most importantly, where can we find uh, you on social media, and as well as the the best place to buy uh, your actual book? Yeah, um, at the best place um, is is those kind of physical shops, if people can. Just, just not everyone can. But the reason being is that even going back to that kind of, uh, to the various kind of uh, book launches, I mean, this shows the absolute importance of like radical kind of bookshops because I simply wouldn't have a venue for launches or kind of discussions. It were not for Carlton books, and I am um, like Lighthouse books, um, the Conley books, you know, as, as well. Now that's like, that's not an option for everyone. Um, but if people can, you know, buy their copies 
in these kind of shops. Uh, I'm doing a launch on Wednesday. I'm, I'm speaking on, the, on Wednesday, the 11th of like December. And it's in Houseman's Books in like London. So they'll be stocking it there as well. But then if it's online, um, if it's if it's UK, like Carlton Books, it cover, uh, you know, like online kind of orders. And then outside of that, it's your online kind of retailers. But if, if people can like try and try and kind of support those those radical networks, you know, like I think, you know, like that would speak to the politics of the James Connolly, you know, there as well. We need a Carlton books, we need kind of Lighthouse books, and we need kind of Connolly books to 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 kind of survive and kind of keep kind of thriving, you know. Yeah, no, fantastic. I'll definitely be sure they can include the links to to all of them in the in the description as well, and uh, even on Twitter for the post. So, no, again, just want to say thank you again, Connor, for for taking the time to oh, uh, come on the show. I know you're a busy man, especially uh, promoting this new book. So it's really appreciated you you taking the time to come on here. That was a pleasure. That's no problem at all. Thanks again, comrades, for tuning in to another episode of Spectre. As always, be sure to leave us a like and review on whatever platform you're listening in on. Be sure to share this with your friends, co-workers, comrades, and anyone else you know. The importance of books like Dr. Conor McCabe's can't be understated. It's vital that we document the political journey of those we hold in such a pedestal. Dr. McCabe's writings offer a rare glimpse into Connolly's evolving political thought as he navigated the fight for workers' rights, socialism and Irish independence. All this done through a sharp critique of capitalism and imperialism, in which Connolly laid the intellectual groundwork for the radical movements that would later define his legacy. And that is why we must remember Connolly's legacy and the legacy left by so many like him in the fight against British imperialism and colonialism. It's vital that we keep class at the centre when we see injustices committed by our own nations abroad. Connolly understood this, and so did many men in the movement of the Irish Republic. Connolly knew that just the removal of the British Army did not alone guarantee emancipation for the working class. In Connolly's own words, if you remove the English Army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organisation of the Socialist Republic, your efforts will be in vain. England will still rule you. She would rule you through our capitalists, through our landlords, through her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individualist institutions she has planted in this country and watered with the tears of our mothers and the blood of our martyrs. So let's keep the legacy of men like Connolly alive. Let's keep the fire of the working class alive, burning brightly in Ireland, Scotland, England or Wales. Let's keep the fires burning across the globe to squash out imperialism, capitalism and all its decaying tortures. Let's fight like Connolly for the emancipation of the working class. A great outside of Kermaida. Their heads all uncovered, they knell to the ground. For inside that grim prison, lay a brave Irish soldier, his life for his country about to lay down. He went to his death like a true son of Ireland. The firing party he bravely did face Then the order rang out Present arms and fire James Connolly fell into a ready-made grave Though the right flag was hoisted The cruel deed was over and was the man who loved Ireland so well There was many a sad heart in Dublin that morning When they murdered James Connolly, the Irish woman God 
thoughts curse on you, England. You cold hearted monster, your deeds they would shame all the devils in hell. There are no flowers blooming, but the shamrock is growing on the grave of James Connolly, the Irish Werbell. The four courts at Dublin, the English bombarded the spirit of freedom. They tried hard to quell, but above all the dead rose the cry of surrender. Towards the voice of James Connolly. I wish I